Okay, so uh, we are moving into the uh, unit number three of uh, this electronic circuits course, and uh, this is the most vital units that I should uh, mention. Consequently, you have uh, so many other uh, chapters like uh, you have uh, unit number four, unit number five, unit number six, where you study some concepts for which the fundamental is built in this particular unit. So in the last few classes, uh, we have discussed about the, the transistor fundamentals, relative fundamentals, the construction, the working principle, and the uh, corresponding biasing techniques. Different types of biasing techniques were discussed, like uh, the fixed bias, uh, then collected to base bias, and then uh, voltage divider bias, uh, emitter bias. Different types of biasing techniques were discussed. But the thing is that, why do you go for biasing? The ultimate objective is to uh, allow the transistor to act as an amplifier. That is the fundamental job, right? And for which we have done this biasing. Now, before I go into the details of this amplification, so let us now try to identify what is meant by. Now, for the time being, let's let's assume that amplifier is nothing but a black box. It's nothing but a black box, and gradually we will investigate what is there inside this black box. Now. This black box can be uh, realized by means of some uh, discrete elements like a transistor, like a resistor, like a capacitor. There are so many elements inside that uh, particular uh, black box. Now, if I just uh, observe this one, uh, this amplifier as a black box, uh, identified by some A, what is that? A, a is nothing but the gain of that amplifier, right? Amplification, as you understand, that means you have some input over here, some input X is being provided. And uh, when uh, this particular input gets amplified, you'll be having uh, some output y. And the relationship between this y and x is nothing but y is equal to a times x. As simple as that. y is equal to a times x. OK? Now your x can be anything. x can be anything. x can be any. So as far as our uh, discussion is concerned, so here we have this x as uh, nothing but an electrical signal. Right. Electrical signal. Similarly, y is another electrical signal. So what kind of electrical signal can you expect? Either it can be voltage or it can be current, right? So accordingly, your X can be voltage or current, or Y can be voltage or current, right? And as a matter of fact, this uh, dimension of this A can be different. For example, if your input is like a, a voltage, for example, input is a voltage, output is also a voltage. So it's nothing but a voltage amplifier, right? It's a voltage amplifier. Input is a voltage as well as output is also a voltage, voltage amplifier. Similarly, suppose the input is a current, output is also current. So it's a current amplifier. Suppose input is a voltage or output is a current. Input is voltage, output is current. So it is known as transconductance amplifier. Input is current, output is voltage. The so trans resistance amplifier. So you have four different types of amplifier. And accordingly, the the time, I mean this particular uh, the A that you have considered the gain. So sometimes if it is both of them are voltage or both of them are current, then this A is unitless. Right? On the other hand, suppose your uh, X is uh, the current and Y is the voltage, then the, what will be the uh, dimension of this A? The resistance, right? On the other hand, if X is a voltage, Y is a current, so it's nothing but a conductor. Right. Mm. Either voltage amplifier or current amplifier or transistance amplifier, transconductor. So we'll go into the details of these different things. But first of all, let's try to identify what is that A is nothing but a gain. Might be a voltage gain, current gain, and sometimes if you would like to realize some power amplifier, in that case, uh, A can be, I mean, uh, so in that case, uh, this A is represented as a power gain. Apart from this gain, the, another important part is the, the impedance. It's impedance or resistance. So whenever I call it impedance, that means we are taking into account the resistance as well as the capacitance, right? And whenever I consider resistance only, that means simple RE. So in this particular unit, we will consider only the this part, the resistance part. And subsequently, when we will uh, consider the corresponding uh, capacitance which are present, in that case, we have to consider the, the input impedance as well. Right. So impedance means it involves the capacitance, and the whenever I call it resistance, that means there is no capacitance involved. Now in this particular unit, we will not take into account any such capacitance, right? Similarly, we have the output impedance or output resistance. We call it R out or Z out. And the fourth important factor is the bandwidth. What do you mean by bandwidth? Any idea about the bandwidth? Uh, 
What do you mean by the bandwidth? Thing is that, suppose I am having some input signal, suppose this is my input, suppose this is my input signal, say this input is represented by x equal to, <coughs> say let it be uh, some x naught sin of omega naught t and y this output is represented by some y naught sin of omega naught t plus say phi naught where y is represented by this right this is your x input signal and this is the y output signal so what is the basic essence the basic essence Consider the magnitude of the signal. So here it is x naught for the input, and for the output this is y naught. So the magnitude is increased. If I just uh, find out the ratio y naught upon x naught, that should be greater than one. In that case, it acts like an amplifier. Okay. And then whenever I consider a signal like this, x is equal to x naught sine of omega naught t, you understand that. This particular signal is having a frequency of the Hertz frequency of f naught. This omega naught is nothing but I can represent this omega naught as twice pi f naught. Where f naught is the Hertz frequency and this omega naught is the angular frequency. Now suppose my uh, x naught equal to say say one unit and y naught equal to say five units. So what is the gain? Gain is five. If I have an input like this, then this output is the magnified version of this input. Sometimes I have also included some uh, phase factor over there, phi naught. That means your input and output there might be, uh, there is a phase difference. Might be. There is a phase difference between the input and the output. But that doesn't make any impact on our analysis. The main point is that I have been, uh, the input wave and the output wave, they must match. This, there should not be distortion. There should not be any distortion. If I have an input signal like a sinusoidal signal, the output side I should have also have a sinusoidal signal. Might be phase reversal or might be phase delay. That is acceptable. Right. right. The nature should not be modified. The sign yes. The input is a sign, then output should also be a sign. Right? Then I can say that okay, the input is uh, uh, amplified, the signal is amplified. Okay, then the thing is that suppose here for some particular f naught, suppose f naught is equal to 1 kilohertz, for example. Hertz frequency is 1 kilohertz. So for 1 kilohertz, suppose my gain is equal to 5. If my input is like 1 sin omega naught t, then output is equal to 5 sin omega naught t plus uh, some phi naught. Now the question is whether this amplifier provides the same output for any frequency. If I change the frequency from say, of uh, 1 kilohertz to say 10 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz to say 50 kilohertz, to say, uh, say few megahertz, tens of megahertz, hundreds of megahertz, few gigahertz, whether the performance of the amplifier remains the same or not? That is the question. Can you get the point? I am having the input signal. Suppose the input is, suppose I am having a variation of input. Suppose this, this is one input, this is another input, suppose this is another input, and suppose this is another input. So there are different types of inputs. Magnitude wise, they are same, but as far as the frequency is concerned, they are not same. So, this is having the highest frequency out of these four, and this is having the lowest frequency, right? So, the question is that whether the, the amplifier that we are going to design, whether this particular amplifier provides the same gain for all such frequencies or not? Typically, not. Typically, you should have a range of frequencies over which the amplifier gain is constant, which we call the mid band here. Yeah. So here it has been shown over there, between FL to FH, between FL to FH, FL is called the lower cutoff frequency, FH is called the higher cutoff frequency. So between FL to FH, the gain is relatively constant. And if you consider any frequency lower than FL, or any frequency higher than FH, then the gain drops. So our point of interest, our region of interest is this one. 
this one, this particular range between FL to FH, where the gain is relatively constant. And in this particular unit, unit number three, we will concentrate only on this particular range, FL to FH. And then in the next unit, we will identify how can we calculate this FL and which what are the factors responsible for determining the value of FL and FH. And the difference between this FH and FL is known as the bandwidth of the amplitude. Typically, you should expect that the bandwidth should be as, as, as high as large as possible. Isn't it? You should expect that this difference between these two, so that over a wide range, over a wider range, I can have a relatively flat gain, a mid band gain, relatively flat gain. So, enhancement of bandwidth. So, bandwidth is represented by the difference between the higher cutoff frequency and the lower cutoff frequency, FH minus FH. I should always expect to increase that particular range, so that over a wider range, I can successfully use this particular amplifier with a constant gain, fixed gain. Right? So, these are essentially, these are the different parameters, but uh, make many amplifier design. Okay? Any doubt up to this? Okay. Then, let's Let's move to some notations in our design. The question is that, suppose you have some input, some uh, say x naught sin omega naught t, and output is given by, output of the amplifier is given by y is equal to y naught sin omega naught t plus y naught t. So if I put up say one unit, then uh, if the amplifier is uh, providing a gain of 5, then uh, the output is nothing but 5 sin of omega naught t plus some pi naught. So here it has been shown that input is having an, uh, for the input signal, the peak to peak fluctuation is 10 millivolt, and for the output signal, the peak to peak fluctuation is 100 millivolt. Right? The input side, you have a 10 millivolt peak to peak, output side, you have a 100 millivolt peak to peak, so it implies that the gain of this amplifier is nothing but 10, 100 by 10, that is 10. Okay? Then the question is that, whenever I design any such amplifier, the thing is that, the question arises, whether the energy conservation, that particular law, does it hold good here or not? What do you feel? What do you feel? Should hold always. But here the input side, you have a signal whose amplitude is lower. Output side, you have a relatively larger amplitude. So it seems that this energy conservation rule is violated. Isn't it? Isn't it? It's a very typical question in, in Grand Viva. You don't have Grand Viva nowadays. Very typical question. A conceptual question whether the energy conservation rule is valid. It should not. It should not. So whenever I consider this one, that means I'm thinking that amplifier is is acting alone. The amplifier is acting as an as an as an isolated element. It's not like that. Remember, in order to amplify any such tampering signal, any such tampering signal, I have to bias the transistor properly. I have to bias this amplifier properly. And this biasing is coming from the DC supply. Right. So if you consider this one into your account, then you can say that this energy conservation rule is not valid. So therefore, in our design, in our analysis, we do have, we do encounter different types of signals. One is known as a DC signal that you have already seen in the last image or biasing operation. Then we have purely transmitting signal which contains no DC and obviously the summation of these two. That means the kind of signal which involves, and so I mean the time heading signal as well as some DC part, average part. And accordingly, we have three different notations for our understanding. What are those notations? So whenever we consider DC signal, so notations are all positive. Hey, sorry, uh, all capital. All capital. All capital. So voltage, current, all of them are capital. 
this V X Y, V I X I Y. So all of them are in capital, right? Whenever I consider a small signal or time varying signal, in that case, all of them are represented in small letters. Small V X Y, small I Y. Okay. And whenever I consider total instantaneous signal, what do you mean by total instantaneous signal? That means a signal which contains both the DC part as well as the time frame. Right? So for which case our notation is something like that. This variable is represented by small letter and the which is represented by the capital letter. So these are the notations which we are going to use in the subsequent analysis. Clear? Yeah? Capital means DC that, that you already encountered in the last unit. All small means it's time varying signal. And whenever it's a, a total instantaneous signal, that means small for the variable itself and capital to represent to designate the node, the corresponding node. That means if I consider say base current, base current, DC base current. So DC base current is represented by by what variable? DC base current? DC base current. Base current. Capital IB. DC base current. Small signal, a time varying base current is represented by small i, small b. And total instantaneous base current is represented by small i, capital B. So these are the notations which we will follow in our subsequent analysis. I am coming to that. What is meant by the total instantaneous? That means you have the DC part as well as the time varying part. Some of this one. This one. It depends whether it contains any DC or not. Whether it contains any DC or not. If it doesn't contain any DC, that means it's a simple a small signal. And if it contains some DC, lastly while discussing that uh, first uh, problem, the no wire circuit. Hopefully you can remember that your input must be ID on a DC, yeah. so that the, the amplifier can operate properly. So at that point of time, it was nothing but a total instantaneous signal. It contains DC as well as uh, the time heading part. But for here, as you see here, this input is riding on zero level and here plus 5, minus 5. Here the output is also, suppose output is also lying, lying on zero level and here plus 50, minus 50. So that means it's a purely time varying signal. No DC part involved. Okay. Any doubt up to this? Okay. Because something which is not exactly related to the amplifier, but it is very much, uh, pretty much common, pretty much universal, and hopefully you have already encountered this one in some of your other course courses like circuit theory. Hopefully yes. Linearity. Linearity, you know. Hopefully you have already the linearity. That means if I have for any system, for any system, suppose there is a black box, amplifier, maybe any other system. I am having the state of inputs. So, suppose I am having say only two inputs, x1 and x2. For the input x1, the output is y1. For the input x2, the output is y2. I don't know what is there inside that black box. I am just considering it as a black box. The input is x1, output is y1. Input is x2, output is y2. And then if you have a combined input like x1 plus x2, and if your amplifier or that particular uh, system provides an uh, output like y1 plus y2, that means the system itself is additive and it must hold good for any such input combinations and that is true for all such inputs, for any type of input. It's not that it is true only for sinusoidal inputs, it is true only for the square wave inputs, it is true only for the angular inputs, not like that. It should be, it should, I mean th these particular equations, set of equations, it must hold good for all such inputs, any such inputs. We should not have any restrictions on the type of inputs and the number of inputs. Right? Suppose I am having n such inputs, x1, x2, x3 up to xn. 
and the individual outputs are y1, y2, yg up to i. Now, if the inputs are summation of this x1 plus x2 plus x2, x3 plus x4, or minus also, minus is a kind of addition, negative of this. The sum of xi, i going from 1 to n, if that is my input, and if the amplifier or that particular system is a linear one, or rather the additive one, in that case, the output should be summation of y i, i going from 1 to n. Okay, that is the notion of additivity. The notion of homogeneity, what do you mean by the homogeneity? Suppose the input is x, input is x, for which the output is y. Now the input is magnified by some factors, alpha. And the output is also magnified by the same factor, alpha. Then it is known as, this alpha can be anything. Any real constant, any imaginary constant, any, any alpha. Had this been the case, and if this condition holds good, then we call it, this particular property is known as the homogeneity property. That means the system is homogeneous. Right? And then, if both of these two properties, additivity and homogeneity, sometimes we are we are confused with the additivity with the linearity. The additivity and linearity, they are not the same. If a system is additive as well as homogeneous, then the system is called a linear system. Right? So, additivity plus homogeneity, will give you the notion of linearity. Yeah? Now the question is that why I am discussing all these stuff about theory. Hopefully I have studied this one in your circuit theory or some signals and systems course. So I am going to discuss this all, all up there. Any idea? In the reason I prefer? Any idea? Any idea? Why I am discussing all these things? Just refer to this particular model of amplifier. Refer to this particular model of amplifier and then there should be linear because V in is equal to tau is equal to A is V in so it should be linear. V out is equal to A V out one is equal to A V in V out root of A V in No, forget about this. Just take a look at this black box, this schematic diagram. Can you identify? Can you identify two such inputs provided to the amplifier? It is your DC supply and has already been shown. One is your DC supply. Second one is your amplifying signal. So accordingly, if I am going to design an amplifier which is a linear one or additive one, for example. So for DC supply, for DC supply, you should have some DC output. For DC input, you should have some DC output. So what are those DC inputs? Last we have seen that suppose I am having some power supply VCC or some PVV. These are the voltage sources which are used to bias the transistor itself. And the currents might be IB, base current, the collector kind IC, the collector emitter voltage VC. These are the things. So these are related to the DC quantities only. And then comes the time varying signal. All small. The signal that I am going to amplify is small. <coughs> and accordingly you will be having this kind of output, for example. Now if the overall system is a linear one or additive one, then you'll see that whenever both of these two is DC supply as well as the time varying signal, both of them are applied, then I can have the final output as the summation of the individual values. <coughs> this will help us in analyzing the amplifier circuit from a different perspective. Okay? So, I am going into the details of this. Okay. Now, hopefully, 
you have already encountered with uh, this circuit. Last we have seen. For the timing, for the timing, uh, let's forget about this one. Let's forget about this one. You have seen a transistor, hopefully yes. This is biased using some bias, I mean the base register RB and some supply voltage VVB. What kind of bias it is? Base bias are fixed bias. And you should have some supply over there. Or you can also have the same supply with the different resistance value. Or you can also have a separate supply. And some collector resistance over there. And the output is obtained from this collector down here. The emitter is grounded. You have already encountered this circuit previously, the bias module. You have seen the biasing circuits. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Then if I go for the DC analysis, what are the different KBL equations? You know the KBL equations? What is that? VBB. Is what? Yeah. IBQ, RB, IBQ. So here I am using this Q to emphasize that it's a quiescent current. That IBQ is with nothing but IB, capital I. But I am using this Q to emphasize that it's a, it's a quiescent current. That means a DC current. Okay? So IBQ times RB plus VBEQ. Okay? What about the KVL in the output loop? VCC is equal to ICQ times RC plus VCEQ. That means these are the equations which we have already encountered in your last image. Right? VVB is equal to IBQ times RB plus VBEQ and VCC is equal to ICQ RC plus VCEQ. But that equation, so th those set of equations are only for setting up the bias. The DC current, DC collector current, DC base current, DC collector emitter voltage. But we are not getting any amplification out of that. So, what is our objective? Our objective is to provide some small signal at the input of the amplifier. I should expect some magnified signal at the output. Right. So, I need to apply some signal. So, I need to apply some signal at the input of this amplifier. So this signal is nothing but this one, which is added with the supply. Previously, whenever we have performed the DC analysis, that time that these VS are absent, no small signal is present. So it looks something like this, suppose you have a radiation like this. And now we add this particular signal along with the DC possible. And obviously, because of this fluctuation, so this time, your base drive is not fixed. Last time the base drive was fixed, some VVB. And accordingly, the, the base current that was flowing is constant, IBQ. But as soon as you add this, as soon as you add this, this base current is not constant. There is a variation of base current. And if there is a variation of the base current, it leads to variation of the collector current. And similarly, the collective emitter voltage will also vary. So when I incorporate this particular thing, this small signal into an account, then you can rewrite the expression for the KVL expressions in the base emitter loop and in the collective emitter loop. What are those expressions? Take a look at this. What are those expressions? <laughs> so, what is the total base drive? <coughs> VVB plus VS, that is total base drive. That is equal to the total current. What is the total current? IBQ plus some a small signal part, let it be small IB. Total, so this capital IBQ plus small IB is nothing but your total instantaneous base current. So, 
what I can write? This I capital B is equal to I P Q plus small i. So when you add this one, when you add this one, this V S along with this V B B, then the total current which is flowing in the circuit is the summation of these two, this capital I P Q plus small i. Okay? And accordingly, what you have over there? This V B Q, that is a constant uh, voltage between the base and emitter plus the additional drive. So, VVB plus VS is equal to IBQ plus IB times RB plus VBQ plus VB. And already you know that VBB is equal to IBQ RB plus VBQ. Right? So, therefore, ultimately it leads to VS is equal to IB RB plus small VB. All of them are small. Small VS is equal to IP RP plus small pp. Clear? Not surprising. Then comes the output side. The output side also, what you can write? When this input signal is present, Vs is present, how can you write down the expression for the PVL? VCC is equal to this drop plus this drop. So VCC is equal to ICQ plus IC, that is a total instantaneous collector current multiplied with RC plus VCQ plus small VC. Okay? And already you know that this VCC is equal to ICQ times RC plus VCQ from this expression. Okay? So ultimately, it leads to ICRC plus VC is equal to 0. That is surprising. To some extent, ICRC plus VC is equal to 0. And from where, so ultimately these are the two equations. One is this one, one is this one, this equation, this is equation number 1, and this is equation number 2. So these two equations involve only the small signal quantities. Small Vs is equal to small IP times RP plus small VB, and IC, small ICRC plus small VC is equal to 0. So they involve only the small signal quantities. Only small signal. What does it mean actually? I have already taken into account these two cases over there. It implies when there is an increase in VS. When, whenever there is an increase in VS, it leads to a corresponding increase in I. And if I increases, I will also increase. Right? And then here we have ICRC plus VC is equal to 0. Or you can write ICRC is equal to minus VC. So if IC increases, VC also increases, but in the reverse direction. Because ICRC plus VC is equal that means ICRC is equal to minus VC. So if IC increases, VC will increase what it diverges, that means it will drop. You want to get the point? So therefore, from these two equations, VS is equal to IVRB plus VB and ICRC plus VC is equal to 0, now you can draw something, you can, you can, uh, you can redraw the previous circuit, which involves only the small signal quantities, because in this particular unit we are going to design the small signal amplifier, we are going to find out the putting voltage gain and all these things. So for which the DC analysis we have already performed in the last unit, and in this particular unit we will only consider the small signal quantities. So if I consider these two equations, VS is equal to IBRB plus VB and ICRC plus VC is equal to zero, then the modified circuit looks something like that. You have Vs over there, you have RB over there, emitter is grounded, and then RC, and then this is surprising. This part is okay, but this part is surprising, no? You have a VCC supply there, but this time this VCC supply is connected to some ground. 
That means we have done the so this is the combined circuit. This is the combined circuit. And last we have also seen the corresponding DC biasing. That means uh, it looks something like that. What DC biasing? How does it look? That was the DC biasing circuit. No. You have some PV there, some RC, and some PCC. That we already seen last week, which involves one bias voltage for the base circuit, some resistance over there, RB, some resistance in the collector side, RC, some bias voltage over there. Now, in today's cycle, what we have done, we have incorporated one small signal in series with this VV, which is that circuit. There is a combined circuit. So, initially, we have studied the, the DC biasing circuit. And today, we have introduced with the combined circuit. And then, from the combined circuit and from the knowledge of the the biasing, ultimately, you have derived what is known as the small signal circuit. Small signal circuit. So, how to synthesize any small signal circuit from a given amplifier circuit like this? Can you identify how the small signal circuit is derived from the main circuit? On the main combined circuit. Hmm? Yes, without using any formula. If I if I take a look at the combined circuit, from that can I draw, can I synthesize the small signal circuit? This is not the small signal circuit, this is the small signal circuit. So just by looking at the combined amplifier circuit, because this is the, this circuit will not amplify anything. This circuit will not amplify. Even this circuit will not amplify. Because it doesn't have any bias. Actually, this is the circuit, this is the main circuit. When you design the circuit in breadboard, for example, then if you design the circuit like this only, then your uh, amplification is performed. Neither this circuit, nor this circuit. The summation of this circuit and this circuit is the this one. Electrical summation. Superposition. Ah, superposition. Electrical summation. Superposition. Okay. So, given this circuit, because already you have seen uh, this kind of circuit in, in, the, in the last unit, we have discussed a lot regarding the biasing and all. Now, interested in finding out the corresponding small signal model and finding out the gain and the different attributes of uh, amplifier. So, my question is that if, if this circuit is given to you, the combined circuit, are you able to find out the corresponding small signal model? Yes or no? Obviously yes, but how? What is the mechanism? Now see, in the small signal model, if you have any DC element, I mean any DC voltage source, current source, that should be made inactive. So, how to make a DC voltage source inactive? Short circuit. So, if you have a voltage like this VBV, that should be inactive. That means it should be connected directly. And this is basically the hard ground, the DC ground. In this model, this is basically the hard ground. Okay. Similarly, you have VCC over there. That's, that is also connected to, I mean, this, this connection should not be there. This should be made inactive. Or it should be another ground. But remember, this ground here and this ground there, these two grounds are not the same. This ground is nothing but your hard ground, this ground. 
a DC ground and these grounds are known as the AC ground because here we are dealing with only the small signal. Okay? If you have any current source present over there, how can you eliminate it? This current source open. So if you have any current source in your circuit, that should be made open. That should make it inactive. Any source that should be clear. Okay. So now. Now you understand that this Vs is equal to IVRP plus Vb. That is the governing KVL at the base emitter loop. Isn't it? Vs is equal to IVRP plus Vb. Now what is that relation? For a transistor, for an input number, if I consider this base emitter side, this is nothing but it is acting like a diode. What is the IV characteristics? The IV characteristics of such a device are VB versus IV. It looks something like that. And you know what is the formula? What is the formula? This IVQ, suppose this is my VBQ, DC base emitter voltage for which the corresponding base current is represented by IVQ. You know the formula VB is equal to VBQ plus IVQ R. What is the relation? This IBQ is given by IS by beta e to the power VBQ by Vt minus 1. Approximately that can be written like IS by beta e to the power VBQ by Vt. Because that part is very very large with respect to unit. Okay. Now when there is a fluctuation, when the VBQ is not constant because your total VB, total VB, I mean this voltage, this small VBE, what is that? As you understand, this is the DC part plus the small signal part, right? And here you have small v capital B, here you have small i capital B. Okay, so therefore, the what about the total current, total instantaneous current, how can you write down this total instantaneous current? This is nothing but I s by beta e to the power V b by V t minus 1 that is small v capital B total instantaneous current. Yes. How is it related? What is this small, small v? This is nothing but I b q plus I b. Yes or no? Given by I s by beta e to the power Small VB is nothing but VBQ plus VB by VT minus 1 and that is approximated to this one. Clear? E to the power M plus N. That means E to the power M, E to the power M. So, E to the power VBQ plus VB by VT is nothing but E to the power VBQ by VT multiplied with E to the power VB by VT. Can I write this part? That, one is the IBQ. that is IBQ. Then you have e to the power VB by VT. Okay? e to the power X. What is e to the power X? Expression for that 1 plus X plus X is factorial and all these things, the other terms. Right? Now what you find? Ultimately, what I have said initially, we are going to design a linear. Relativity and the homogeneity. These two conditions must hold good. That means the you know that I P and I C they are related linearly. Yes, as long as the device is operating in the active region, linear region. I C is equal to beta times I P. Right? But remember the relationship between V B E and I B. This relationship is not at all linear. It follows an exponential relationship. Already I have mentioned over there. As Vs increases, 
your base current increases because if there is a change in Vs, accordingly the base current will also be modified. It will also, it will also increase. And if the base current increases, the collector current will also increase. And that between IC and IB is a linear one. IC is called linear time side IB as long as the device is operating in the active region or linear region. Okay. But the point here is that the relationship between this uh, input voltage and the input current for any transistor is not a linear one. It follows exponential formula. So how can you ensure then that if the input changes by some amount, I mean input voltage changes by some amount, the corresponding input current in a proportionate amount, how can I ensure this? If the ultimate is a linear, uh, it's a non-linear, it's, it's an exponential function. Right. This I versus V, because we have already written, we have already seen that expression. This I is nothing but a non-linear function of V. We have squares, it is V B by V T whole square by factorial 2, whole cube by factorial 3, and all these things. So you have to ensure that this nonlinearity part is just removed. Right? Then what you have to ensure? You have to ensure that all these higher terms should be neglected. All of them. All of them should be neglected. Now, if they are neglected, then what can I write? Then IBQ by IB is going to be IBQ into 1 plus VB by VB. Only the linear term is preserved. Right. Then, what is the condition? The condition is that this x squared, x cube, x three power four, those higher terms can be neglected if and only if this mod of x is much much less than one. Right. So, what is x here? V B by V T. So, what is V T? V T, you know, this is nothing but the thermal voltage, ATR voltage. And at room temperature, 300 Kelvin, this is close to 25 millivolts, 25.5 millivolts. Now, if your base drive or change in the base drive is small with respect to the DC GBQ, then this condition holds good. Okay? So, under this condition, what you can write? This IBQ plus IB. IBQ into 1 plus VB by VT. The condition is that this variation, this VBE, this variation is small with respect to the, the DC value. Suppose this DC value is kept at 0 0.7 volt, that is 700 millivolt, then this fluctuation can be say 5 millivolt or 10 millivolt. Is it okay? Then what I can write IBQ plus IP is equal to IBQ into 1 plus VB by VT. IBQ gets cancelled from both sides. And the small IB is represented by capital IBQ multiplied with VB by VT. Right? So small IB, that is the small base current, now it is found out to be a linear function of the small signal base emitter voltage. Small base current is, I mean, IB, small IB, and that is equal to some constant, IBQ is constant, VT is constant. Lateron will give some name to it, will give some name to it, for the timing, hold it on, will give some name to it, IBQ upon VT, and then multiplied with some VBE. That means the input side, the input voltage and the input current, they are related linearly, IB and VBE. And you know that IB and IC, are, they are also related linearly. And then ultimately IC and VC, this formula already you know. The output side, what, what is the, what was the KBL equation? ICRC plus VC is equal to zero. All of the linear stuffs. The only problem was there in the input side because ultimately it's a exponential nature. So that we have to restrict. And when this condition holds good, then only I can call the signal as a small signal. That means if your input fluctuation, small PBE, is much much less than the thermal voltage of 25 millivolt, then only I can say that it's a small signal. 
then only all these higher order terms, second order terms, third order terms can be neglected. And as long as you design some low power amplifier, I am not talking about uh, the, the high power amplifier, for in which case those higher order terms will be used. But as long as you are, you are going to design some low power amplifier, in that case, those higher order terms are neglected and this base current and the base emitter voltage, the small signal base current and the base emitter voltage, they are related linear. Clear? Okay, fine. So, let us observe this from a pictorial point of view. Already you have seen this one, this variation of IV with PV. Right? This is the DC operating point, VBQ, represented by this green dot, and the corresponding base current is represented by IBQ. And then, over and above this VBQ, I am allowing the signal to be applied. And that is a small signal. That value is equal to say 700 millivolt, and suppose this fluctuation is plus 5, minus 5. The overall fluctuation is 10 millivolt. Here, then this fluctuation is small. That means what? This exponential graph e to the power x can be represented by this e to the power x is nothing but 1 plus x. So that slope over there is almost constant. Clear? So the slope over, slope at this point and the slope at this point, slope at this point, they are not they are not different, they are same. Clear? Then this input fluctuation over there and this out and this current fluctuation, I mean the input uh, voltage fluctuation over there and the input current fluctuation over there, these two are linearly related. Can we get the point? We have also discussed a similar kind of thing in the diode set, if you can remember. Right? Okay. Now, if you have the input fluctuation like this, the current, the base current, the corresponding collector current fluctuation is nothing but the beta times of this IV. As long as the device is operating in the active or linear region, this IC is nothing but beta times IV. And then comes your last equation, ICRC plus VC is equal to 0. If you can remember that one, this equation, ICRC plus VC is equal to 0. Remember it is a small signal equation. It involves all the small signal parameters. IC, VC, all of them are small signal. So therefore, So, let's assume that this is the IC axis. Typically, we designate the horizontal axis by voltage. But here, we have to identify which is the cause and which is the consequence. Initially, whenever we have uh, analyzed the input side, what is the cause? There is some fluctuation in the base of voltage for which the base current gets modified. So what is the cause? Voltage or current? What was the cause? On the base emitter side, you have some fluctuation at the input voltage for which the base current gets modified. So voltage was the cause and current was the consequence. Right? So, voltage was the cause, so cause is typically represented along the x axis, the independent variable, and consequence was the current. Then, some IB was there, and IB and IC they are related linearly, IC is equal to beta times IB. And then, when this IC is allowed to flow through the output side of the transistor, then it develops some current of voltage. 
receive because of the flow of this IC sum, VC gets developed. So this time, what is the independent variable? What is the cause? Cause is the current, collector value. What is the consequence? Consequence is the current of voltage. So that's why, unlike traditionally, here we have used the collector current along the x-axis, the independent variable, and the collectivity of voltage along the y-axis, or dependent variable. Any doubt? Typically, we, we designate the voltage along the x-axis and current along the y-axis. And then, what was the formula, what was the equation? The CRC plus VC is equal to zero. Right. So, it is nothing but the equation of a straight line. Straight line passing through origin. Y is equal to mx. Straight line passing through origin. With a slope equal to minus of rc. Clear? And then suppose, can you tell me what is that particular point? What is that particular point? This point. What is the significance of this point? What is the significance of this point? What is it? Yes, that means what? Huh? What is the significance of this point? IC0, VC0. I mean, small IC0, small VC0. So, what is the significance of this point? Hmm. That means it, it symbolizes. It symbolizes what? It symbolizes the quiescent operating point, the DC operating point. Because at this particular point, you have both IC and VC there. I mean, the small signal components are zero. So it symbolizes the DC operating point. Right? So you have some, so although here small IC is zero, small VC is zero, but remember, you have some capital ICQ, capital VCQ, capital VBQ, capital IBQ, which are non Right? Then, so this line corresponds to small IC equal to zero, but you have some non zero ICQ. You have some non zero ICQ. Over and above this small non zero ICQ, suppose you have this fluctuation of IC, small IC. Right? Let me, let me just uh, draw that part. Okay. Let me use the same type of programming so that you understand. That was the fluctuation over there. So that fluctuation, so this corresponds to what? This is small i capital C. Right? This point corresponds to this point corresponds to what? This point? Small i capital C equal to, so this is small i capital C, so here you have this DC value plus this primary component. So this point over here, this point corresponds to capital I capital C cube, right? 
and then you have this fluctuation. This fluctuation is nothing but the i c, small i, small c. Small i, small c. Okay? Now this is the time axis. Any doubt up to this? Any doubt? Okay. Then, when this uh, fluctuation is present, that means your input is uh, input for this particular thing. You have plus IC. I mean, IC to plus some delta IC and IC to minus some delta IC. Then, whenever you have this positive fluctuation over there, the corresponding fluctuation in the VC is represented by this one and when the, there is negative fluctuation for the collector current then the corresponding fluctuation is represented by this one because the here the slope is a negative minus rc so when the collector current goes positive remember this is once again this as, as i have already mentioned this is a, a dc operating point that means it symbolizes ICQ and VCQ, small IC is 0, small VC is 0, that means capital ICQ and capital VCQ, this point, right. So whenever your input signal, I mean input for this case, this collector current uh, increases like this, the hash portion represented by this gray, then you have this half cycle of the sinusoidal signal represented by gray. And when the collector current goes below the DC operating point, represented by this blue hash line, then the collector emitter voltage goes up the VCQ, represented by the blue hash line. So it symbolizes when the collector current increases, the collector emitter voltage reduces. So there is a phase reversal. This phase reversal can be identified from the slope itself, from the equation itself, or from the graph itself. This equation says that ICRC plus VC equal to 0. That means if there is an increase in IC, there is a drop in VC. Magnitude wise, it will increase. But phase wise, it will opposite. Right? And then, if I consider this particular slope, this variation of IC is along this variation of VC is along this. So therefore, just if you just take a look at the slope, then if there is a positive change in IC, there will be a negative change in VC. But we are not interested in, in into the sign. Rather, we are interested in, in the variation, that variation. And remember, it's a function of, obviously, it's a function of RC. If you have more RC, you have more such variation over there. We will come to the details of this one later on. The gain expression, finally you will see that the gain expression is a function of this RC. Okay. Kevin, do you have any query up to this point? Any doubt? Yes or no? No doubt. Great. Okay, now let me just show you that thing that I have already discussed at the beginning of this class that you can have four types of uh, possibilities. The voltage, mighty a current, output might be a voltage or a current. And we are here representing the amplifier as a black box and as a two port network. I don't know whether you have already studied the two-port network in a circuit theory force or not. Yes or no? No. Two-port two network. Two-port network you have not studied. So basically, uh, here you have uh, two ports at the input side. Here you have the, this, this is known as the input port. Two connections are there. This is known to be the common line, reference terminal. 
and here also the output is another set of ports. So this is known to be the reference line. This is the reference, the same reference line over here at the input side, and the same reference line over here at the output side. And you have the two ports. This is known as the input port, input side. This is known as output side. Typically, for a two-port network, this side is considered this terminal is considered with a positive with respect to this terminal. Similarly, this terminal is considered with a positive with respect to this terminal. And traditionally, the, the currents which are entering the two-port network is considered to be the positive direction of the current. Right. So that's why traditionally the input current, this output current is shown this way positive. So this is the generic structure of any two-port network. You have two ports, input port, output port, and you have one common term, I mean common terminal over there, both at the input side as well as the output side. And these are the notations of the input voltage and output voltage. This side positive with respect to this side, and this terminal is positive with respect to this terminal. Now sometimes I don't know whether uh, whether to consider input voltage as your uh, voltage as your input signal or the current. We are going into the details of this one. And according to we can have four different combinations. Input might be voltage, output might be voltage, input might be current, output might be current, or input voltage, output current, output input current, output voltage. And accordingly, we have four types of amplifiers. One is known as a voltage amplifier, current amplifier, then trans resistance amplifier, trans conductance amplifier, and then and when you study the the feedback amplifiers in detail, they will see that we will encounter all these four types of amplifiers. Voltage amplifier, current amplifier, trans resistance amplifier, trans conductance amplifier. Okay? Then the question is that, when can I uh, identify my input as a voltage input and when can I identify the input as a current input? Then accordingly, you have to design the amplifier. So, for this, let us consider a scenario like this. Suppose I don't know what is there inside this black box. Suppose I only the only thing that I know is that uh, I am having a black box like this, which is having some input resistance. Do you understand now what is meant by the input resistance? Suppose you connect the two ports, so you have the two ports available to this. So these are the two terminals, right? And if you connect something and you provide some voltage over there, some test voltage, you measure the current, the current being drawn by the rest of the circuit. And if you take the ratio of these two, that will give you the, the input resistance. You have to identify the input port for this particular amplifier, you have to, or any black box, you have to identify the input port this is my input port. You have to make all the independent voltage source inactive, all the independent current inactive. Then you identify the input port, then apply some test voltage between these two terminals, find out the current being drawn by the circuit, take the ratio that will give you the input resistance. Suppose the input resistance for this particular black box is given by R in. Okay, R in. And then suppose I am having some small signal Vs which is having some internal resistance Rs. And depending upon the relationship between this Rs and R in, sometimes this Vs as a voltage source, sometimes I will regard this as a current source. So, what is the relation? Suppose the source resistance is 100 ohms, Rs is 100 ohms. And the input resistance of this particular black box or amplifier is much much larger than R. Suppose this is 10 kilo ohms, 100 kilo ohms, 1 mega ohms. 10 kilo ohms, that means it's 100 ohms, 10 kilo ohms, that means how much? 100 times more. 100 times more, here you have 1000 times more, then you have 10,000 millivolt. So much much greater. Vs is equal to 10 millivolt here. What will be the voltage present over there, which is actually the input of the amplifier. This is the actual input signal which you are, which have applied, and V in is the actual signal which is getting coupled. All the signals that you applied is not that the entire signal gets coupled. A portion of the signal gets lost over there, isn't it? 
Then what is that voltage which is actually coupled to the input of the amplifier? You have to apply simple a voltage division law. So what is that? V in this voltage equal to total voltage Vs upon the total resistance Rs plus Rn multiplied with Rn. Right? Now, if Rn is much much larger with respect to this Rs, then that ratio added by Rs plus Rn is almost close to unity. Isn't it? That, that one is close to say 10 kilo ohms and here you have only 100 ohms. So, Rn is much much larger than Rs. As long as this is true, then what about your V in? This is almost the same, this 10 millivolt. So that means here if you apply 10 millivolt, the same 10 millivolt is also coupled at the input of this particular amplifier. Okay? This time, when this condition holds good, then I say that now I can regard this amplifier as as a voltage amplifier. Clear? The condition is that Rs should be much much lower as compared to the input resistance of the amplifier. So you have some kind of input signal with a certain input resistance, source resistance rather, and for the amplifier it is having some inherent input resistance. Now you have to compare which one is large. Now if the input resistance amplifier is large with respect to the source resistance of the signal source. In that case, I will regard this amplifier as a voltage amplifier and regard this voltage, this source as a voltage source. Nothing other. Suppose this time your R in is much much less as compared to R is. Then what happens? So let's take the same set of value for R in and take uh, the R s to be very large. Suppose, uh, let's take R s is equal to 10 mega ohm and uh, let's take the R in value to be say the same one, same set, 10 kilo ohms, 100 kilo ohms, 1 mega ohms. This time R in is much much smaller than R s. So, I have to the same set of R in value, 10 kilo ohms, 100 kilo ohms, 1 mega ohms, like before, but the value of R s is, is made very large. Previously it was only 100 ohms, this time it is 10 mega ohms. You can keep it 100 mega ohms also, no problem. Then, now if you, uh, if you just one second follow the same methodology, V in, uh, I mean V in is equal to R in by R S plus R in into V S, that time, do you expect the, uh, the same voltage across the two terminals of the input, uh, to across the two terminals of this R in? Yes or no? No. Hopefully no. V in is, when R in is equal to 10 kilo ohms, when it is 10 10 is coming to 1 millivolt. When Rn is equal to 100 kilo ohms, then this voltage is 0.1 millivolt. And when Rn is equal to 1 mega ohms, then this voltage is 1 millivolt. So that means uh, this uh, voltage which is getting coupled at the input of the amplifier is not fixed. Previously it was fixed. Every time it was close to 10 millivolt. But this time 0 0.01 millivolt, then 0 0.1 millivolt. That means as the Rn value is large, so we have more coupling, less loss, more coupling. When R is equal to 10 kilo ohms, we have only 0 0.01. You have provided 10 millivolt and only 0 0.01 millivolt. That means 100. 100 of the entire input signal gets coupled. Right? I think not 100 or 1, one out of 1000. 10 by 0 0.01, 10 by 0 0.01, 1000, 1 out of 1000. Then when R is equal to 100 kilo ohms, when R is equal to 100 kilo ohms, then 0 0.1 out of 10, 0 0.1. And then when R is equal to 1 mega ohms, out of 10, only 1 millivolt. So that is the base what I, what I can have. The thing is that it's not constant, 1 millivolt, 0 0.1 millivolt, 0 0.01 millivolt, millivolt, it's not constant. So I cannot regard this as a voltage source. So what I can do? So now you have to identify what is my current that is entering the amplifier. What is the input current? I in. What is that current? This I in, this current is nothing but this current is nothing but this Vs voltage divided by R s plus R in. Right? Now that can also be regarded as this voltage drop divided by V in upon R in. 
Now, if you take this ratio, 0 0.01 by 10 kilo ohms, 0 0.1 by 100 kilo ohms, 1 millivolt by 1 mega ohms, these ratios are constant. When it increases by a factor of 10, it also increases by a factor of 10. When it increases by a factor of 100, it also increases by a factor of 100. So when R increases by a factor of 10, I E also increases, uh, your V in also increases by a factor of 10. That means this ratio V in upon R in is remaining constant. So irrespective of your R in value now, what you find is current is remaining constant, I E is remaining constant. Every time for this case it is 1 nanoampere. So when this is the case, that means when your input resistance of the amplifier is much much small as compared to the source resistance of the signal source, then I regard this signal source as a current source, not as a voltage source. And you have to, accordingly you have to find out the corresponding equivalent model for the current source. So if I have the voltage source model, you will be able to find out the current source. If I have these Vs and Rs and if this Rs is much much less as compared to the input resistance, then the signal source is regarded as a voltage source as I've already seen. So constant V just like an ideal voltage source and when your uh, input resistance is much much, input resistance on the amplifier is much much smaller as compared to the source resistance, then I have to find out the equivalent not on circuit, not on equivalent. So we have Vs, Rs, this combination Vs, Rs. So the corresponding not only equivalent model you have to develop for which the resistance should be the same, same RS. Current expression IS is nothing but VS upon RS, a constant I. So current source here. So the first case, I'll regard this as the voltage amplifier, the input is a voltage. For the second case, I'll regard this as a current amplifier, the input as a current. Okay. Any doubt? No doubt. Okay, so now we are moving to the to the BJT modules. So as I already told you that here BJT is a particular kind of device for which you have three different terminals: emitter, base, collector. And using this BJT and using some other elements, circuit elements, some lumped elements like. Uh, resistor or capacitor or other elements in the power supply, you have to design one amplifier. And for amplifier in an art cell is nothing but a two port network which have which is having some input port over there and some output ports over there. One port, one output port. And one terminal is considered with a common terminal. Right. So accordingly while designing any VJT based amplifier, I have to select out of these three terminals, one terminal has to be identified as a common terminal, right? So we have emitter and collector. So if I consider the emitter terminal to be my common terminal, then this configuration is known as the common emitter configuration or CE configuration. Common emitter configuration for which the base emitter is your input port and the collector emitter is your output port. So emitter is a common terminal, right? Secondly, if I have, uh, if I select the base terminal as my common terminal, in which case your emitter base is an input port, is acting as input port, and collector base is acting as output port. This is known as the collector base terminal. I mean the, the, the common base uh, configuration. Emitter base is an input port, and collector base is an output port. And on the other hand, the third one, the common collector, in which case the output is, your, is between the base and the collector, and the output port is between the emitter and the current. So you have three different modes of operations and each of them are having their own advantages and disadvantages. This common emitter, common emitter is typically used, vastly used, most, more popular, but obviously it is having some shortcomings, some limitations, for which the people move from common emitter side to common base and obviously common current is also having some advantages which cannot be provided either by common emitter or by common base. So these are the three different mode of operations for the VJT based amplifiers. One is known as a common emitter, for which the emitter terminal is considered with a common terminal. We apply all the signals with respect to the emitter terminal. The major of the input, uh, inputs with respect to the emitter terminal. And then you have the common base terminal, for which the base is considered with a common terminal. 
एंड फाइनली का कॉमन कनेक्ट लेना सो नाउ वी आर मूविंग टूवर्ड्स द डिजाइन ऑफ एम्पलीफायर एंड टूवर्ड्स द एनालिसिस ऑफ दिस एम्पलीफायर hopefully you understood what is meant by the small signal and how can we draw or how can we synthesize those equations the small signal equations and if i have some composite circuit transistor resistor capacitor or here we have not considered capacitor at least the transistor resistor and the power supply then from this composite circuit, how can i draw the corresponding small signal model then it is become very difficult for anyone to deal with a three terminal device like a transistor so that's why people have moved from the symbol of a transistor to some models so what are the models is the basic uh, understanding behind developing some models for any such uh, device it is in different types of diode model in unit number 1 What are those? Huh? No, no. What are those different? CVD. Ah. CVD model. Yes. Constant voltage. Constant voltage. Ideal light model. Ideal light model. Yeah. Constant constant voltage model. Constant voltage model. Yeah. Yeah. The the general model that we have that means you have basically the diode is represented by what diode is represented by one resistance one voltage source one resistance some vd some rt now if both of them are zero that means ideal if r is zero v is non zero a constant voltage model if both of them are non zero that means practical model generic model because easy for diode why because Diode is a two-terminal device having only two terminals, anode and cathode. But for transistor, you have three terminals: emitter, base, and collector. So, what is the mechanism? How do we act out those uh, diode models, different models? How do we accomplish this one? Actually, we have observed, uh, stimulated the diode by by means of some uh, stimulus externally, and accordingly, we have observed. What is the consequence? What is output? For example, if the diode is ideal one, if the diode is ideal, we have seen that if my input voltage is greater than zero, the diode conducts. If the input voltage is less than zero, diode doesn't conduct. Similarly, for the constant voltage model, we have seen that if my input voltage is greater than some some threshold, 0.7 volt or so, diode conducts. And if the input voltage is less than that, that doesn't conduct. So forward bias, reverse bias, right? So accordingly, you have devised different diode models. So here also, for the transistor, you have to devise such models just by observing the corresponding current voltage relationship. Doing so, you have to identify one terminal as the common terminal. Typically, the emitter terminal is considered the common terminal. So what you have noticed? You have noticed that the voltage current relationship, the base emitter. If I consider this, uh, the CNPN transistor, this base emitter junction is acting like a diode. Nothing other than a diode. It's simply a diode, right? The formula that that is the expression for this I P versus V P. That is that is the variation of this base current with respect to this base emitter voltage. If I have some constant DC voltage over there, V P Q, then the corresponding current is I P Q, and whenever there is a variation. Voltage, and if I assume that that uh, that slope is small, I mean uh, that that variation is small, then I can consider this slope is a is a linear one. It's a constant slope you have, right? So you have some variation over there in the base emitter side, base emitter voltage, and some variation over there in the base emitter. I mean the base current I V Q. How can you realize this one? Some input change, I mean input uh, voltage change, is represented by some current change. Right? 
So what is the form? How can I accomplish this one? This I is equal to I is upon beta e to the power dv by dt. That is the formula. So then, in order to find out the slope, differentiate this i b with respect to v b, del i b by del v b. What is that? I s upon beta m x. What is the formula? What differentiation? One upon m, rather m into e to the power m x. So here m is equal to one upon b t. I s by beta e to the power v by v t. One upon v t is your slope. So one upon v t e to the power v by v t. What is that? I s by beta e to the power v by v t. This is nothing. So I b q by v t. What is del i b upon del v b? Del i b by del v b. That means the variation of this is due to the variation of the voltage. And the inverse of that, inverse of that, is nothing but input resistance. Because here the base emitter side is your input side, and base current is your input current. So base emitter voltage is nothing but input voltage. And base current is nothing but input current. So the variation of this del I B with respect to del V B, that means variation of current with respect to with respect to the variation of the voltage, is nothing but the input conductance. And one upon that is the input resistance. So one upon del I B by del V B measured at the Q point, measured at the point, is your input resistance given by V T upon I B Q. Last time. We have seen now uh, this I B uh, here. We have mentioned that I have told you that hold it on this one. Small I B is equal to small I B is equal to capital I B Q multiplied with V B by V T. So this small I B is equal to V B multiplied with this particular thing I B Q by V T. Yes. So that I have told you that hold it on. So I will give some name to it I B Q upon V T or V T upon I B Q. So that is not for resistance. V T upon I B Q, which you typically call it like R in, right? R in. So if this is my model over there, two port network, base emitter is my input port, collector emitter is my output port. And between base two emitter, I do have a resistance represented by this R in, whose value is given by V T upon I B Q. Is there any other parameter apart from this R in? So R in is one parameter which can model the Dependence of this base current on the base emitter voltage. Can there be any other parameter? How to synthesize the different models for different types of devices? I mean, one thing you know that collector current depends on the base current. That is one. Can you expect the collector current to depend on some other? It's true that collector current depends upon what? Uh, collector current depends upon what? Base current. I is equal to beta I B, and here you find. That the base current is upon the base meter voltage. So therefore, I can say. Therefore, I can say that the collector current also depends upon the base meter voltage. So what is the relationship? I know this expression. I so I s e to the power V by V t. So now, if I have this variation, I variation of I c with respect to the variation of V b. This del I C upon del V B is nothing but if you just follow the same expression, uh, same uh, uh, calculation, then ultimately what you are getting is del I C upon del V B is nothing but I C Q upon V T. 
variation of collector current with respect to the variation of the base emitter of voltage measured at the Q point. And that is known I versus V, del I versus del V. And collector current is measured at the collector terminal, voltage is measured. And the collector port is output port, and the base emitter port is the input port. So that's why it is known as the trans conductance. Conductance. I versus V. So that's the conductance. And since you have the collector current and base emitter voltage, not like collector current and collector emitter voltage, not like base current and base emitter voltage. It's the collector current which is measured at the collector side and base emitter voltage which is measured at the input side. So ratio is nothing but your trans conductance which is represented by ICQ upon VT. So you have identified two such elements. One is R in which represents the variation of IB with respect to the variation of VBE and then another element which is represented by GM that signifies the variation of IC with respect to the variation of VBE. And eventually these two parameters R in and GM they are related. How are they related? As you know R in is equal to VT upon IBQ and GM is equal to ICQ upon VT and their product R in and GM their product is nothing but IC of IP that is equal to beta or beta DC. Right. So what do you find? If you have some fluctuation in the base emitter voltage, if I have some between these two terminal, then ultimately it leads to some change in the collector current. So it is nothing but a voltage. So this collector current manifests itself as, as a current which varies in accordance with the base emitter voltage, which is applied over there. Right, so that current source, which which is uh, there inside this uh, black box, is nothing but GM time. What is that current? Collector current is IC. So if I have some fluctuation over there, and that fluctuation multiplied with transconductance GM is nothing but your collector current that is IC. So IC is equal to GM times VM. Can we expect that the collector current? depends on the collector voltage, yes or no? The collector current depends on current Depends, yes or no? Yes. Yes. And that signifies the, uh, in your case it is uh, base width modulation. For BJT it is base width modulation, for MOS it is known as the channel length modulation. Right? We have discussed this one, hopefully, while considering the, the working principle of transistor. As you have, uh, so here VC, VC is equal to VCB plus VB. As you have higher VCB, what happens? For VC means what? This base emitter, uh, this base character junction is reverse bias and the amount of this reverse bias is increased. Right? Higher reverse bias, then you have more depletion region width. Right? Less recombination, so more collector current. And if these two factors, I mean, uh, if uh, this uh, variation of this uh, VCB or rather VC with the collector current, if this variation is considered to be linear variation, yeah, this is a formula. Typically, you have seen that IC is equal to IS e to the power VB by VT. And if that particular effect is taken into account, then I have to add another factor along with this, which is represented by 1 plus. VC by VA. What is that VA? VA is known as early voltage. Typically, if you just extrapolate all these different curves, then ultimately will meet at a point which is known as early voltage. Typically, it is very large. Negatively, it is very large, say 200 volts, 300 volts, something like that. That means it signifies that your collector current also depends upon the collector emitter voltage. It depends upon the base emitter voltage, and apart from that, it depends on all collector emitter voltage. So, therefore, this IC versus VC. So IC depends upon VB already have seen that dependence of IC with respect to VB and then the dependence of IC with respect to VC is measured by finding out del IC upon del VC at Q point, at coefficient point. And if you do this calculation, then you will see that this is coming out to be IC Q upon VA. 
and one upon this is nothing but the output resistance of the transistor itself represented by va upon ic now with these three elements now already have seen three elements one is r in second one is uh, gm v in part which is nothing but a voltage dependent current source and then finally you have r not so these three elements ultimately gives rise to the complete model so i am not going into the details of why forget about that let's try to identify this is my black box this is a emitter terminal which is common both to the input as well as to the output this is the base terminal this is the collector terminal so this base emitter the input port and collector emitter forms the output port between base emitter you have this r in between collector emitter you have this voltage dependent current source that is gm v in and then between collector emitter you have another resistance which is represented by r not right and then if you just take a look at this if you just take a look at this how is it connected basically it is the connection is something like that this and then this so it looks like an inverted pi it looks like an inverted pi this connection isn't it this connection because they are internally connected both of the emitter internally connected so looks like an inverted pi so this model is known as a pi model there are so many models there are so many models this is one of those models which is known as a pi model and typically if i if i take some typical value for example if vt is equal to 25 millivolt uh, as you know the uh, thermal voltage typically at 25 millivolt at room temperature this base current suppose it is 5 microampere and early voltage suppose 400 volt with beta is equal to 100 then these are the typical values r pi is equal to 5 kilo ohms gm is equal to 25 millimo and r not is equal to 800 kilo ohms so if you should have some fundamental idea about the typical those r pi gm and r not typically r pi is 5 to 10 kilo ohms r not is typically large in the range of hundreds of kilo ohms and gm is is relatively small 20 uh, or, or in the range of uh, millimo. Okay. Okay. So uh, with this, uh, uh, let me uh, conclude our uh, introductory discussion on uh, small signal amplification.